Jack, you are on the right link. Sorry about that. Hello. How are you? I'm Todd Arneth here. Nice to meet you. Hi, Todd. How are you? Good, thanks. How about you? Okay. Doing okay. Good, good, good. Um, so we'll just wait. You know, it's usual for people to take a few minutes to get on here. So we'll wait a couple minutes for a quorum, if that's all right with you. And then I'll do the introduction I've got and then turn it over to you. And we finish at uh, 2 p.m. Great. And the crowd will mostly... Should... Yeah, it's mostly sleep fellows and sleep uh, physicians and other providers in our in our uh, sleep clinic and sleep program. Very cool. No, I appreciate the opportunity to to meet with you all and uh, look forward to uh, hearing from uh, some of your trainees, some of their thoughts about some of this work. Yeah, very interested in what you've got to say. So we'll just give people a couple minutes. It's been a little while since I've worked at a uh, local hospital, a uh, strong hospital here in Rochester. So the pace and uh, the whole day-to-day -day piece is, uh, of being at the hospital is uh, different for me now. So yeah. I can imagine everyone's rushing around or this is the time to eat their lunch or catch up yeah. on note work, whatnot. Less physical rushing with Zoom than there maybe used to be in between meetings where you were hustling to a different location. Right. Welcome into Grand Rounds, everybody. Hello. Hello. Oh, for those of you who I can see, it's very nice. And it's nice to know uh, I can see folks in, in Michigan. Sorry, I apologize. I had my camera off because I was eat because I'm still eating. I apologize. No worries. I uh, I just finished lunch a little bit ago, so. <laughs> all right, Jack, we'll give another minute. We're almost a quorum, I would say. We have most, if not all, of our fellows here. Hopefully this will be an ideal time. My my kids are at school right now, so hopefully I'll have as much bandwidth as possible to present. Uh, there's a good chance that uh, sometimes whenever they get home, all of a sudden my Zoom connection seems to go downhill. So it gets dicey. No no pets. You think that might disrupt the presentation? <laughs> I hope not. My dog can't get up here to the uh, my third floor attic. So. All right, well, I think we've got a quorum here. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, welcome in, everybody. Dr. Chervin, welcome. Dr. Shelgakar is out today, so I have the uh, great pleasure of introducing our external Sleep Grand Round speaker today, who is uh, Dr. Jack Peltz. And uh, Dr. Dr. Peltz is a licensed clinical psychologist in New York State and assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at uh, SUNY Brockport. His research is primarily focused on the role of sleep in individual and family functioning in both adolescent and college-aged populations. Dr. Peltz has received funding from the National Sleep Foundation and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Foundation, and he's currently examining the role of sleep neurophysiology in college, stu college students' daily functioning and well-being, and so we're very excited to have him present to us today. <clears throat> the title of his presentation is, What Do We Assume? When we assume we know our patients, unpacking the social determinants of sleep health. Dr. Peltz, thanks so much for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. Hey, well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, to be with you. 
uh, virtually or otherwise. Um, and so I, uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about um, some thoughts around um, race and socioeconomic uh, determinants of uh, sleep health. Now, my experience with Grand Rounds has uh, been pretty a fairly brief lecture, and then you go about your day. Um, maybe you get a chance to discuss it uh, on your way back to your office with a colleague. Um, but in my uh, experience, the DEI-related issues, uh, so diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, um, are so ingrained in our lived experience that in some ways I think it incorporates, it's important to incorporate a little bit of a different approach. So um, I would ask uh, at certain points today to get a little bit of participation from you all. Um, love to hear some of your thoughts as we move forward. Um, I think it's pretty customary uh, as we go and start a talk um, that you give your disclosures. And so I was very dutiful and went on the University of Michigan site and was able to provide these are my financial disclosures. I have none, although I am an avid sleeper. So in that regard, <laughs> I can disclose that that is something uh, important to me. But when I'm thinking about a talk related to DEI related issues um, and whatnot, I, I think it's important. And this is Two pieces. One, um, not necessarily my area of research, although I have done some work in this. But when it comes to disclosures, I think it's really important to think about who we are in terms of our identities. Um, now, I am not sure if you've seen this identity wheel before, but it's actually from the University of Michigan, um, specifically the, the uh, Inclusive Teaching Initiative at the University of Michigan. And as you look, you can see that there are uh, a number of different aspects of our identity. And the reason I bring this up is that when I think about what I need to disclose in terms of uh, my identity and what I need to disclose in terms of um, my relationship to this work, um, I think of all these different pieces to my identity. And so you'll notice here that some of these things are identity pieces that are seen by others. So perhaps the color of one's skin, um, one's gender. Um, and the other pieces though, there are other pieces that are perhaps unseen. And so take a look at this list on the left um, to think a little bit about what your patients may see when they come into uh, encounter you in an office. And might they not see? Um, and as we think about those aspects that we, our patients, either see or do not see in us. We also have to think the other way, which is what we see in our patients in terms of their identity, uh, as well as what, what we may not see. And so I bring this up because my DEI disclosures um, are very much uh, sort of check boxes. And if you check boxes, um, you'll see that I represent a lot of what we think of the dominant identities in today's culture. So these are my DEI disclosures. Um, you'll notice that these aspects of my social identity are ones that have tended to give more power in our society. Um, and I say this because this is the lens through which I have seen the world is what I was born into. Um, and it's also something that given uh, my different identities, I'm still very much learning and in a process of learning um, how that impacts others. And so, um, although, and I, I left one box unchecked in that, um, in terms of you know, my background being raised Christian, um, but not uh, really adhering to any religious faith now and uh, r uh, raising my children uh, into the Jewish faith. And so in that regard, uh, I perhaps leave one box unchecked, um, which is maybe not part of this dominant identity. So I bring up this aspect of the learning piece uh, because my 13-year-old will consistently remind me if I have mispronounced any of her friends um, that I am very much in a spot where um, you know the, my my biases and my ways of seeing the world are certainly important in terms of uh, being able to acknowledge um, that they are there. So in terms of today, what I'd like to do is talk about um, sort of how we conceptualize sleep health, um, as well as some barriers, perhaps. I have two projects that I've done that I think touch on a little bit of this work in terms of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, so I'd like to share that, those two projects with you, working with some providers in the Rochester area. 
as well as um, uh, some work we did to develop a, a sleep environment scale. And then I'd like to finish a little bit with thinking about you in terms of your work, um, what, what things you are doing or can do in terms of being able to um, provide or promote sleep health equity. So in terms of just sort of things to think about or sort of overarching questions as we go through, um, thinking a little bit about what role can or do I play in supporting sleep health equity? What barriers might one encounter toward attaining sleep health equity? as well as what, what steps can one take um, to help uh, the, the people that one serves in terms of attaining uh, sleep health equity. So in terms of this regard, the um, work I come back to, the definition of sleep health comes back to Dan Vizey's um, uh, uh, fairly recent paper, um, looking at, or I guess now almost a decade old, um, looking at what is sleep health. And so it's a multi-dimensional construct. Um, that is very much um, focused on more positive characteristics of, of sleep health. Um, also pieces that can be physiologically quantified. So this is the idea of looking at sleep health in contrast to what we perhaps see as a deficit model. Um, but his version of being sated so that there is adequate satisfaction and alertness positive or proper timing of sleep, uh, as well as efficiency and proper duration. So if these are some of the pieces of sleep health, well, um, then how else can it be conceptualized or what else is important towards uh, examining this? And I come back to my work as I'm a clinical psychologist, but my earlier work is in developmental psychology um, and come back to the work of Yuri Bronfenbrenner and the social ecological model. So in this model, we see that uh, individual person, in my case, I work with children and families predominantly, um, is believed to exist within um, a specific framework of uh, different nested systems. And so these nested systems suggest that there are many direct and indirect influences on that individual child or individual adult. Um, when I think of an example of sort of how does this play out, um, well, uh, I think of a child, let's say uh, there's an anxious high school student. Um, so we see a little bit individually, perhaps that anxiety is uh, genetic in nature, uh, perhaps part of their temperament. Um, but in terms of the context in which they live, um, we may see that they have uh, very engaged parents, let's say, maybe the parents have very high expectations. Um, they're interacting with those parents uh, daily, on a daily basis. But we also see that they exist within a social context. and come back to some of the work I've done in school start times where um, this will have uh, very much an effect both on the family system as well as the individual child. And then there's a larger cultural context, um, perhaps in the culture in which we live now where nutrition is certainly emphasized, sleep less so, although I, I am optimistic. I think uh, we are a culture that is gradually coming around um, to really see how sleep is a, is a pillar of our health. So, Michael Granner has taken this uh, social ecological model and sort of expanded on a little bit uh, in terms of emphasizing the role of sleep and its impact on fu functioning and ultimately mortality and longevity. And so when we think about the consequences um, of deficient sleep, so we have poor quality or, or short duration, um, we see all sorts of uh, negative outcomes in terms of either hypertension or mental health problems, um, heart disease, all of these things affecting longevity. And so I like this model, especially in terms of conceptualizing sleep and sleep health, because of the fact that there is so many different factors um, that are influencing an in individual sleep, you know, from the individual level up to the societal level. Um, and those ultimately have downstream consequences. Now, one of the pieces that I think is important as we look at this societal level, and this comes into, uh, you know, certainly uh, today's world, is the influence of racism. And take racism as uh, uh, the definition of racism. I I bring from Beverly Daniel Tatum, who wrote a wonderful book uh, in the late '90s called "Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria." And in this definition, um, she writes that a system of uh, racism is a system of advantages 
based on one's race. And so if we take this definition to its sort of logical conclusion, one of the things that we come across is that um, to have an advantage based on one's race um, is pretty much the uh, situation for any white individual in our society. And she likens it to being on a moving sidewalk. And that when you're on a moving sidewalk, you walk at a normal speed, but you get to where you're going a lot quicker. So this aspect of systematic racism uh, in our society is certainly um, provides those with those dominant uh, characteristics, or whether it's in terms of racism, whether it's being white, but other sort of systemic aspects of power, such as um, you know one's sexual orientation, being heterosexual, uh, uh, being male, um, all of these pieces um, certainly define a systemic power dynamic. Now, one of the reasons I, I think that the definition or that the, the analogy, I'm sorry, of the moving sidewalk is so important is that just by standing on this moving sidewalk, um, so just by simply the nature of having been born white, I am granted certain privileges. And the notion of this, this granting of privileges um, will occur whether I wanted to or not. However, there is a way of counteracting them, and that is the notion of to be actively counteracting these moving forces. So this is the sort of area now looking at uh, systemic racism and counteracting it is to be anti-racist. And so what are ways in which we as sleep clinicians or folks related to you know, the sleep world can count, try to counteract um, some of these forces, um, these dominant forces that simply um, are systemic in nature. One of the reasons I bring this up in terms of looking at sleep health and sleep health equity and sort of builds on this idea of systematic, uh, systemic racism is this concept of weathering. So Arlene Geronimus um, brings up this uh, important piece around marginalized people suffering constant stress um, due to poverty, discrimination, other aspects of um, uh, systemic oppression. And it's damage at a cellular, a cellular level, at a damage to the body. Um, but also in terms of this wearing down of the individual um, due to discrimination or other forces, I'm also having to put on a false identity. And so here, dealing with these constant stressors can take a toll on one's body and mind. Um, and so this is you know, an important piece as I think back, as I think of all of these different barriers to sleep health, um, the underlying notion of systemic racism and systemic oppression, as well as uh, um, aspects uh, of weathering. So in terms of, of this work, I think of different sleep health um, equity barriers. And this uh, comes from a chapter um, by Judith Blanc, um, which is in uh, Michael Grandner's book, Sleep and Health. Um, this uh, comes from her chapter, uh, specifically looking at um, you know, barriers that your patients or clients might face in terms of attaining sleep health equity. So I want to just take a minute uh, to examine some of these different, uh, these 10 different um, barriers uh, which um, are provided to think about your work um, and to um, think a little bit about what you have seen. And so I'm just curious, I want to pause for a second here and to think, uh, and if you guys, I believe there is a chat function to either hear from you that, you know, yes, I have seen these barriers or that there are other barriers that I encounter as well. Um, so I'm just going to pause for a second and give folks uh, a chance to either respond in the chat um, or to um, get a chance to sort of think a little bit about their work and where they might have seen these. So if you have an example or if you have um, some barriers that you have see in your work in terms of uh, helping others uh, uh, attain sleep health equity, um, please share that. I'll give you a second. And by all means, if uh, you don't feel like you can get your thoughts out in the chat, um, please feel free to also uh, feel free to uh, take yourself off mute 
and uh, share your thoughts. Thank you, Todd. Mm. Um, these are that's a very hard question that you posed. I would say it's 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 on the surface easy, but actually it's hard because whenever we would see something that might fall under one of these categories, we don't know. Um, you know, we don't know whether to attribute it to uh, race or ethnicity or anything like that, or other things that are associated with them, like the immediate one that comes to mind is um, socioeconomic uh, status. And, um, you know, I tell you an example, um, you know, back before any of this was very popular, meaning it was uh, at least 20 years ago, about 20 years ago, you know, we, we saw that there was um, a big um, performance discrepancy in schools. Now, my own research had was often had to do with children and kind of behavioral issues in relation to their sleep. And we asked the question, um, uh, you know, does does race and sleep, does sleep differences by race have something to do with that cognitive and performance discrepancy, that performance gap in schools? And when we asked our, that question, sure, there was um, there was that relationship, um, but then when we looked at it and accounted for who qualifies for a subsidized lunch as a measure of socioeconomic background, um, to my memory, it wiped out the uh, the, the race effect. Um, yeah. And then, so you know, it it then you could say, well, maybe it's it's some race effect that led to the socioeconomic issues, and that that could be. But you know, it's it just gets complex. I appreciate you you sharing that. And I um, so I live in Rochester, New York, where uh, race and socioeconomic status are are very highly correlated. Um, we're in a school district where um, about ninety percent of kids are uh, on free and reduced lunch. Um, and it is a district where it is majority Afri African American, um, and so this is it, it is a it's a big it's an important question that you bring up, and it is in some ways you know as we try and figure out you know what is what are these things that are causing these these challenges ultimately um, you know the I think my hope is that in sort of recognizing some of these systemic factors um, we have a different uh, a number of different ways of responding. Um, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in, in a few minutes, but this idea that um, the work that, you know, I've just done some work in this is that um, I wouldn't necessarily uh, say that it has addressed the systemic factors. And I think the harder part is how do we begin to get at um, the larger systems at play here? Um, I also really appreciate you bringing up, and I also thank you very much um, uh, that we are, um, bringing up you know, two different pieces in, in terms of also bringing up your ideas in, in the chat. Uh, I'm looking at one comment in terms of the confusion between biases and racism. Um, so if racism in terms of being a you know, systemic advantage, um, you know, based on one's uh, you know, uh, race, that this in many ways um, leads to uh, biases um, and um, it's, you know, part of the, the uh, you know, leads to, you know, our sort of different ways of thinking the assumptions that we make. Um, so in a way, uh, racism in some ways founds or is, is at the, you know, at the root of many of our, our, our biases um, as a form of bias. Um, so I, I also, you know, in terms of thinking about some of this research, um, there are two colleagues that uh, I have a ton of esteem for. Uh, Mona El Sheikh and, and Tiffany Yip, and I just wanted to show some of the um, work in terms of the past decade, and certainly more recently. Um, you know, these are some of the titles of of Mona and her colleagues' uh, work, um, and and I highlight this work for a number of reasons. Um, one is to you know looking at in terms of the areas of of um, 
know, psychopathology and sleep problems, they often have their roots in childhood. And so this is, you know, the, the work of, of these individuals. So these researchers, um, you know, begins, uh, certainly focuses on that early time period. And as developmental researchers, uh, I think they would agree that their early work is in many ways looking at the predisposing factors for later issues with sleep um, and the effects of um, different uh, effects on sleep. Um, and so in this case, um, the with, with Mona's work, um, the importance of looking at uh, economic adversity and its effect in terms of uh, its interrelations with sleep um, and outcomes, um, health and otherwise, um, for for children. Uh, I'm drawn to one of her recent papers looking at socioeconomic disadvantage. So in this case, we see um, that socioeconomic disadvantage, um, that the more disadvantaged individuals um, <clears throat> uh, uh, was associated with higher levels of social class discrimination. Um, and that discrimination ultimately was associated with uh, uh, worth sleep, so worth sleep. So in this case, worth sleep efficiency. Um, and, you know, one of the respect that really helps for their work uh, certainly is, you know, using, um, you know, looking at uh, this mixed, mixed method work and involving both more objectively measured sleep as well as um, self or other self-reported measures. Um, Dr. Tiffany Yip also, uh, you know, instrumental in terms of uh, this work and, and, and understanding um, uh, diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. Um, but specifically focusing on on racial discrimination. Um, and I, I bring up her work in terms of um, looking at how sleep is both uh, a direct effect of discrimination, but also sleep operates as a moderator in terms of some of the outcomes. And the reason I bring this up is in terms of our work and thinking about, you know, the, the importance of our work in terms of uh, sleep health and, and promoting sleep health and sleep health equity is this idea that um, sleep can facilitate resilience and more positive outcomes. Um, and so in this case, uh, in uh, a fairly recent paper um, by um, Dr. Wang and Yip, um, uh, focusing on this notion of uh, sleep as a, a resilient factor in resiliency. Um, and so on days here, uh, as is um, when adolescents are experiencing greater discrimination, um, if they slept longer and better the previous night, they engaged in more active coping, so better problem solving, um, that subsequently had better well-being. So in this case, sleep is a factor in terms of um, their uh, resiliency. Now, the reason I bring up um, this sort of as both a real important aspect of our work and looking how, how sleep can facilitate resilience is that this is ultimately not changing barriers or underlying causes. What we're doing is addressing solutions. Um, and so this is very helpful in addressing individual situations, but not necessarily changing the system. So I want to be very clear in terms of delineating that and that part of this work, if we look at racism uh, um, and different forms of discrimination as being systemic, um, that how can we then change the system? And I'm not saying I have an answer to that. And some of the work that I'll present is not necessarily getting at changing a system, but that is some of the ultimate, you know, I think uh, work um, you know, that needs to be done. So in terms of in terms of some of my work. Uh, in terms of approaching some projects. So I've been uh, a teacher for um, a couple of decades now, as well as uh, um, a, a clinician, although I haven't done as much as clinical work um, by the nature of either through research and teaching uh, responsibilities. And so this was a project that um, the AASM Foundation uh, funded in terms of wanting to work with my community um, in uh, addressing sleep health and specifically um, how to address uh, a fairly large swath of youth um, in the Rochester area. And so the Center for Youth is a comprehensive uh, facility, a comprehensive programs um, that uh, really addresses 
um, upwards of 30, 35,000 Rochester youth in multiple levels, one of those being uh, school-based counseling. And so uh, the school-based counselors are, are located in schools throughout the metro area um, to, support, uh, to support the youth in those schools. And so um, my goal was to collaborate with the Center for Youth and specifically to work with their school-based counselors in terms of providing them with more information about sleep and sleep health uh, in the hopes that then they might be able to transmit this information to the youth that they work with in the hopes that they would be able to um, promote sleep health amongst um, the thousands of youth that they that they are in charge of. Now, before getting into the project, I also want to, this comes back to a little bit about the DEI disclosures and that the Center for Youth um, is largely, uh, uh, in terms of the administration of uh, these administrators of the Center for Youth are largely black and brown. And as a white person coming in um, and specifically working with school-based counselors who are largely people of color, um, that this was a important aspect of understanding our collaboration. Um, and so, you know, being being mindful of um, sort of what I brought to the table, wanting this to to you know be as uh, a a true collaboration in terms of trying to meet their needs rather than just simply to you know swoop in and do what I think is right for a community. And so, uh, Rochester is being one of the poorest cities of its size in the country. Uh, more than 50% of the youth under age, teen, under age 18 live in poverty. Um, this was something I was very mindful of as I um, came in and asked them what you know, would be most helpful as they trained their school-based counselors. And so we worked a, together to, to find a, a good system of where I could work with the counselors um, and answer questions uh, about sleep and sleep health uh, as a way of increasing their knowledge and increasing their interest in working with youth. Um, but being driven largely by their questions um, and their areas of interest. Um, as part of this project, um, I also was very curious as to um, you know what was uh, you know what was their engagement with youth. We don't frame a lot of uh, um, our you know counseling faculty or you know counselors in terms of sleep health, um, and so you know what was you know their interactions with individuals in this regard. Um, and so this, you know, and some of the data that I collected, um, we, you know, I had a, a survey uh, before we got going, uh, as well as a, a post survey and, uh, after the um, basically about good six months of working with them. Um, and when we talk about, you know, how often they discussed or involved sleep related material, um, when we see that there was largely, uh, you know, 90% almost, you know, sometimes or less. And so, um, it left a lot of information in terms of, you know, perhaps that they were not engaging with their youth around sleep. But in speaking with them, the youth that they um, encountered on a day-to-day -day basis, sleep was very much something that they felt was more relevant. So that was a curiosity for me is sort of, you know, how much are they engaging with their youth around sleep? But then also um, thinking about how knowledgeable they felt. And this was, um, you know, I think, you know, when we think how knowledgeable do we feel about sleep? Well, I'm a good sleeper, um, so I know a lot about it. Um, but, you know, the majority of folks felt somewhat knowledgeable or less. Um, so there was a, you know, a fairly, um, not necessarily a, a strong knowledge base, um, but I was curious about this knowledge base as well. And so I ended up giving them a, a as part of this initial um a survey, a little bit of a, a test of sorts to try and understand a little bit more about where their knowledge was. And they were very good at answering true false questions. I'll tell you that. Um, in terms of some of their work, they were able to um, uh, correctly identify, um, you know, where some aspects of sleep, um, you know, hurt or hindered performance. Um, there were also a number of questions that were more pertaining to uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, so CBTI-based principles, which was another area that I spent a fair amount of time um, in trying to um, provide even you know, deeper knowledge in that regard. But these were some of the, the basic questions that, yes, they, were, they had uh, perhaps a, a fairly 
decent understanding. But as we get into some of the more nitty gritty of sleep, so specifically looking at how much sleep you know uh, the children need, um, this idea of social jet lag, and what is the weekend oversleep? Um, what happens if you can't fall asleep? What even a good sleep environment is? Um, so these questions sort of get at a little bit more that perhaps there were some areas that would be important to focus on. And so using this, these data allowed me to focus a little bit more on the actual uh, areas um, that I felt were that they were in need of. And what we did is we met um, through some of their early trainings. So unfortunately, this was during the pandemic. So it was uh, very much a Zoom-based uh, model. Um, which I felt was uh, certainly challenging in terms of um, connecting with folks. Um, but I also was able to meet um, with a small group uh, on monthly meetings, which we met for um, a month uh, for the better part of a year. Um, and then uh, at the end, we had a, a large, uh, larger get together, which we actually were able to do in, in person. And uh, when I surveyed folks at the end of this, in terms of um, you know throughout uh, uh, working with them and trying to increase their understanding of, uh, of different aspects of sleep and sleep health, um, I was heartened to see that there was more um, of a interest and more of a, a, um, a desire to engage uh, uh, youth around sleep. And so we see that um, in terms of folks who um, uh, either often or very often um, went from about um, 8% uh, um, um, to, or sorry, uh, to about 10% up to uh, closer to 40%. Uh, and so in this regard, uh, I felt that it was helpful for them to give them license to start prioritizing uh, talking about sleep uh, with their youth. And I thought that was something which um, was, you know, the part of the work generated. Um, but we also, you know, saw, although perhaps smaller, um, but in terms of their, you know, how knowledgeable they felt um, in terms of that, we see some increases in terms of uh, that there was in general increases in, in, in that feeling knowledgeable about sleep. Um, and that uh, the folks who were quite a bit or very much knowledgeable about sleep increased um, by about 7%. Um, but um, on the whole, that this was a, a chance to um, increase that knowledge base so that they felt more comfortable. Now, again, not to say that this was making a systemic change, but the hope is that by empowering folks to talk to individuals, to, to the youth about sleep, would give them a chance to, for the youth to then begin prioritizing sleep. And if there's one piece that I would love to have delved into is to actually look at um, youth uh, in terms of look at, you know, the children and see how much and, you know, what was changing in terms of their, uh, you know, either understanding about sleep or how their sleep and their own lives changed. So while it wasn't officially an intervention study, um, that was something I certainly would have would have um, liked to have explored a little bit more. Um, another project which I uh, became involved with um, was in looking at sleep environments. And specifically, in, early in my clinical training, um, I worked at a community mental health center in Rochester where we uh, focused a lot of our time doing um, mental health visits to clients' homes. And one of the uh, families that I worked with, often it was uh, parents and typically mothers and children, and often children were in danger of being removed by Child Protective Services. And so our work was with both mothers and children to sort of help them develop parenting, uh, their parenting skills, as well as this is for my pre-sleep life, uh, where, I, where I focus more on sleep. Um, but I remember coming into uh, the child's room and the, being able to, I was given a tour of uh, the apartment and in the child had a bed, but that bed had only two legs. So it was like sleeping on a ram. Um, the child also had a dresser for his clothes, but the dresser had no front to the drawer. So it was really just stuffing clothes into um, some cubby holes in a sense. But this got me certainly focused on what are the concrete needs, 
um, of my clients and uh, certainly youth uh, and families uh, in poverty. Uh, but then also coming back to sleep, what are those specific environments that children are sleeping in? Because we know the importance of a sleep environment in its specific relationship to, to uh, sleep. And so um, this was a project to uh, took on some other colleagues from Auburn uh, University, as well as um, Case Western and Mississippi State, as well as a uh, former mentor at University of Rochester. Um, but essentially what we did is we took a very uh, qualitative based um, uh, survey of, uh, of the sleep of the home um, to try and make a more quantitative measure that would be easier to use in research, but also easier to use by clinicians to get a better sense of what does that sleep environment look like. It's not something that we immediately think about when we ask, how are you sleeping these days, um, to think a little bit more about um, all of those factors um, that could be influential. And so we were able to take a fairly large instrument and try and narrow it down through different analyses um, to focus on um, the quantitatively the most important um, aspects um, of the uh, child's sleep environment. Now, there are a number of certain limitations I'll start out with and that this was a, a um, research which we conducted through parent report. Um, so we had about 840 parents um, of five to 18 year olds, um, but uh, this was conducted through an online survey. Um, it was largely a white sample. Um, we did have approximately uh, a little more than a quarter of the sample. Um, the families were record, uh, reporting uh, incomes of less than 50,000. So with those pretty good socioeconomic diversity, um, but um, certainly is you know room to grow in terms of thinking a little bit about the sleep environment scale, we call it the cases, in terms of thinking about um, what role does uh, socioeconomic status um, play in terms of the sleep environment. So as part of this um, uh, process uh, in sort of weaning down to uh, 13 items, one of the pieces that we wanted especially to be aware of is thinking about where does the sleep environment, where is it distinct from actual sleep hygiene? And so while there is a lot of overlap, we wanted to develop a measure that was focused more specifically on that sleep environment. So these are the 13 items um, that uh, through uh, our analyses were driven to be the most important in terms of understanding both the child's you know, sleep environment distinct from hygiene and other behaviors, um, and also helpful in terms of us and being able to think, and again, this is based on parent report, but um, these aspects of the environment um, that affected their sleep and functioning. Um, so the items range from what we would expect, so external noise and light, um, sharing rooms, um, uh, but also, uh, interestingly, uh, did pet uh, sleep with the child as being a, a negative influence? Um, also thinking about these families who got long concrete needs. Um, so whether they had a blanket, a pillow. Um, interestingly, bed did not figure into it. Um, it was not one of the items that um, was supported through the data. Um, but uh, in addition to sort of the larger home atmosphere, we also see an emotional climate in terms of does the child feel safe in the home? And so we you know, are currently looking to see how this these scales, the scale operates within children and in college students as well, um, in terms of looking at actual self-report and looking at their sleep. Um, in terms of the, the data that we collected, uh, we did find that there was certainly, uh, in terms of the sleep environment, uh, it was uh, highly correlated with many different aspects of both sleep and sleep-related behaviors. Um, so whether that be more hazards in the environment, uh, um, being more uh, or, uh, connected to or linked with higher levels of daytime fatigue and, and, and sleep initiation issues, but also uh, issues in the environment being linked as well to different aspects of the of their behavior. Um, the sleep environment also being uh, illustrative of um, family functioning. So we see that uh, families that, uh, or that children's sleep environments that uh, had more hazards um, generally had less cohesion in the family, 
parents were more hassled and are more likely to use physical discipline. We also see that this is certainly a scale that is going to be tightly linked with uh, socioeconomic status. Um, and ideally, you want to sort of create a measure that's um, going to uh, not necessarily um, be will 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 be able to uh, measure uh, irrespective of uh, of of things like SES or whatnot. But in terms of the sleep environment, that was something that we were unable to uh, to attain. Um, and we can think very much about how the sleep environment um, is uh, SES related. And certainly, there's a lot of research to support that. When we look specifically at our data in terms of um, some of these families with you know lower earnings, um, that they experienced all of the or uh, many of the different uh, forms of uh, sleep environment hazards, um, and although it didn't make it into the scale, they certainly had children that were more likely to sleep on a floor without a mattress. So again, coming back to this concrete needs. So. I, I you know, bring this again to think a little bit about sleep health and sleep health equity in that trying to understand what are some of those environmental um, hazards to sleep and if we can address those, how they might be, might be better able to afford children uh, more opportunity, better opportunities to sleep. And that this is, you know, understanding what some of those environmental hazards were and, and their impact. Uh, was certainly a first step in that. Again, though, this is looking at solutions to um, some relatively important issues, but not necessarily addressing at a systemic level. Uh, and so as we get into the larger systemic level, this is how can we address poverty on a larger scale um, in that the idea that, that addressing that on a larger scale would also perhaps um, improve some of those sleep-related environments. So, um, just in sort of finishing up and, and thinking a little bit about, um, you know, this work and that um, I appreciate you've, you've uh, shared some of your, uh, some of these barriers that, um, you know, from electricity um, uh, in the jails to um, obtaining uh, CPAP distribution, um, access to health insurance uh, and other, um, you know, language barriers. Um, but I'd like to take a minute right now, and for those of you who have a, um, some headspace, that you could respond to some of these questions as you think a little bit about what can or do you play in terms of supporting or things we sleep health. I'd love to hear uh, what sort of efforts you guys are involved in uh, in terms of trying to remove those barriers. So you've mentioned some of the barrier. Now I'm curious as to how either your training or your time now is spent in terms of um, addressing uh, and in terms of um, perhaps overcoming some of those barriers for the folks you work with. So I'll pause here for a moment to see either perhaps to respond in the chat or to respond um, verbally and, and uh, take yourself off mute. Well, um, I'm sure Dr. Dunez wants to tell you about something, but I can start. Um, we have, well, or do you want to start, Dr. Dunez? Uh, you, you, can, you can start and I'll pick up. Okay, well, um, so uh, one thing that, so we've been interested in this for a, a good while. Um, we've done surveys in Southeast Michigan where it's also a highly urban, socioeconomically challenged environment. Um, and we did it in conjunction with an organization called Sweet Dreams, um, which started in the early 2000s because um, a, a, a nurse actually got interested when she saw that in schools that sometimes there were kids sleeping in the hallways at their desks, at desks that the teachers put in the hallways. And why was that? Well, because those kids were falling asleep in class. And um, why were they falling asleep in class? Because they had no good environment to sleep at night at home. No heated environment, in fact. Um, so they started a, um, a program to uh, intervene in schools and um, have a sleep education day, make it fun, make it entertaining, provide sleep a sleeping bag for free to every child just in case there was an issue with not having a warm, a heated space to sleep at night. Um, giving coloring books about sleep, 
um, all kinds of things. And we got involved with them to try and figure out to demonstrate a need. So we did a needs-based assessment. We also later did research with them to show was there any impact of their interventions. The needs-based assessment, we developed a questionnaire in a much less rigorous way than you did about the environment, but ended up with some similar questions. And it was interesting because you didn't show, you showed correlations, which was interesting with outcomes. Um, I don't remember if we did that so much, but we just looking at the concrete numbers, we actually couldn't show those schools where Sweet Dreams was going into. We couldn't show that a lot of them didn't have beds, for example. And uh, and in fact, that was a small number. There were some, but there was, it was pretty small. Um, but so, uh, you know, it, of course, you know, you do one survey, you know, in early stage research in one place, it doesn't tell you anything well you really need to know it much bigger but um we did also test their intervention and look at it at, at to what extent it was lasting and um we were able to show that um in a uh it was sort of a cluster um comparison you know where you intervene one place before the other but we we were able to show that their, their education day, which affected parents too in that study, we're looking at preschool age children, that um, you could give them an extra, almost very close to a half hour of sleep that was lasting a month later. Um, so it starts to show that, um, you know, you two are teaching kids to recognize, to learn time for the first time. You know, and, and then they could point to the clock and say, 8.30, time for bed, you know, um, you know things like that. Um, we did further work um, with Head Start programs in um, New York, actually, with helping Karen Bonac, who you may know, um, who was you know, on a health literacy pro pro project. And there we had longer outcomes and um, had difficulty showing that there was persistent effect. And we, we were left with that those educational programs to try to address some of these sleep challenges to the extent that they're addressable through health, sleep health literacy and education, um, that you probably need to have a really good long-term enforcement program. And um, we still need to go the next steps on that. But um, I, I appreciate you, you saying that. And I just sort of echo some of that. I, the work that I did with the Center for Youth and the school-based counselors, there were sort of two areas that they came keep coming back to or that they often... Um, in terms of how to support youth. And one was addressing trauma um, in that population and its impact on sleep, uh, as well as um, some of the concrete needs. Um, uh, I had gone in with some preconceived notions about some areas that I wanted to, uh, or some areas that I thought might be helpful in terms of sleep. Um, and one of the areas that, I, that they really sort of brought me to better understanding was they know a lot of the kids, they could use a comfortable blanket um and so just simply the addressing those those concrete needs was uh, of utmost important as well um dr Denise, did you also want to um respond yeah so i i came to sleep uh research from public health and um realized being in a clinical department that sleep health is expensive especially if you have sleep apnea and when you don't have health insurance it's almost impossible to get treated um, so, uh, Dr. Chervin encouraged me to write a grant to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine Foundation, and uh, they have a community grant to um, help um, with sleep equity in communities. So we we wrote a grant. It was actually um, during the pandemic, and uh, the grant was awarded. And in September 2021, we opened our first clinic. Um, so. Not only that we were still in the pandemic, but there was also a big recall of the CPAP machines. And so we had several barriers we had to overcome. So long story short, we started the first clinic in September 2021. And this January uh, 2024, we're still going strong with um, very strong um, stream of patients who need sleep apnea. Some of them already have a diagnosis, but because they lost their health insurance, either they lost their job or they moved or other reasons. Um, 
they lost also their treatment. So we give them treatment um, to an ongoing sleep apnea. And um, interestingly, a lot of them have moderate to severe sleep apnea. And we're operating within Hope Clinic, which is an organization. It's a faith-based organization, but has different subspecialties. And among all the subspecialties, our sleep clinic has one of the lowest uh, no-show rates which shows you the need and shows you the commitment of the patients. And I can see today that there are several physicians who are volunteering um, in Hope Clinic um, on Saturdays. We have a clinic once a month or once every other month now. But um, it's, it's a great opportunity to give back to the community and try to alleviate some of the disparities that people incur, um, incur um, yeah, sleep health disparities. And just out of curiosity, is that is the funding stream supporting that? Is that something that can be ongoing? No, or, or, mm. no the funding stream was only for a year, but we were able to, um, I don't know how, but donations, gently used uh, devices, we were mm -hmm. able to extend that and we're starting, I think, our year four. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're, we're actually looking for additional um funding right now but because of the pandemic we were not able to and and um recall we were not able to spend our funds on buying CPAP machines for example so right mm -hmm. now we have a lot of inventory of brand new CPAP machines so I think that would help okay. us um in the past we relied on the CPAP bank of University of Michigan which is a great um you know um system to to get a uh, gently used uh, machines but mm -hmm. now we have our own new inventory. That's awesome. I, I certainly understand the barriers toward continued funding, continued support in doing such a, a worthy project. Yeah, um, thank you. But I um, really appreciated speaking with you all and getting a chance to hear what's going on in uh, Michigan, as well as uh, your work and, and getting a chance to connect with you all. So, so thank you very, very much um, for your, your thoughts and uh, for connecting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peltz, uh, very much. Really appreciate uh, your thoughtful work and uh, bringing it to our grammars. Yes, Thank thanks you. for thanks for sharing. Thanks for that great presentation, Dr. Peltz. Appreciate it very much. Well, I uh, I hope that it's seventy and sunny in Michigan, and you get a chance to go outside and run around and uh, enjoy uh, enjoy some time. Um, uh, yeah, but know, if that's not the case, I a, wish you the best. It's as 70 well. <laughs> and sunny here as it is in New York. So, <laughs> so and please, uh, I, mean, I wish Dr. Chilkar well. Uh, I heard that uh, with her foot, uh, she's been laid up. And so I, uh, I hope that uh, she's doing okay and, and can get back soon. Yeah, we will do. we will do. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Okay. Thank you very much.